Well, good evening. Um, you'll see the slide there. That's a slide actually from, remember the Walk Through the Bible seminars? We, we did a number of them in Hamilton. Well, this is the Walk Through the Bible slide on Nahum. And you have to guess from the slide what the, what the theme is. And the theme essentially in the Walk Through the Bible uh, is flood. But obviously it's the flood of, of judgment. And no doubt you'll be learning a wee bit about, about that as you've been uh, going, going along. Right, I have my clicker here. Um, update on Jean. Jean is, uh, is doing well. It's a year ago just now. She went into Cross House Hospital on the 23rd of April. She very nearly died on the 7th of May. These dates are kind of locked into uh, my, my psyche. She was in Cross House for a month. Um, didn't really expect her to survive that. Has ongoing kidney issues. Very, very low kidney function. Uh, only one of her kidneys operates and it operates at a very low level. But not at a level yet that necessitates uh, dialysis. But the, the, the problem organ then proved to be the heart because uh, it, it was very vulnerable and she in actual fact including in the hospital she's had three heart attacks uh, the most recent being in November where to take her up to to A&E in &E and there and the cardiologist essentially said we're not letting you out of here until you get stents in uh, at the Jubilee now the problem always with the stents was the condition of her blood vessels to get the stents actually through the line, through. But that was able to take place, I think, about 7th of November. Uh, she got two stents, and uh, the corner, the main corner of the artery, the left anterior descending, you pick up all these things. The left anterior descending was between 80%, 95% blocked. And the cardiologist had given us a pretty dismal outlook. He said, we may have to use a microscopic drill to drill through the plaque. <laughs> uh, but he said the next day they didn't need to do that fortuitously. They didn't need to do that. Uh, they were able to get two stents in that artery. So I would say her energy levels are pretty good. The big challenge just now is the balance of medication because it was blood pressure that triggered this to start with. So they're trying to keep the blood pressure stable. But what sometimes happens is it drops too low now and then she can pass out. <laughs> so... <laughs> But she's doing well, and we really appreciate the, the prayers uh, of church here. I know a number of you, you know, kept constantly uh, in touch. Uh, I'm, I'm doing okay. Uh, if this flicks on, maybe need to wait for the wee buzz. Oh, there's the wee buzz. Yeah, I'm, I'm do, doing okay. As the expression goes, I'm in rude health. And speaking about rudeness, there you are, and all the, the glorious... Uh, like her. That, that was a year ago just now. I was actually doing cycle the month of May for prostate cancer. Uh, well, Jean was in hospital. You're not allowed in for a short visit uh, each day. So I'm still cycling. And believe it or not, I started cycle the month of May today for prostate cancer. For a very busy day with two services on at uh, Seagate. And then I went out and did my first 10 miles of 300 that will do in May. And I'm doing it specifically in memory of John Wood, whom some of you would know and, and love. So if you're interested in my, my Just Giving uh, charity page, you're, you're welcome. Now up to, I think, £650, chiefly from the folk in the church, because John was such a well-loved, a well-loved well and well, well-respected guy. Um, so there we are. The backdrop to me doing, doing that was the death of of John, and I hadn't planned doing any more charity bike rides, you know, I'm kind of <laughs> bike ride out, but uh, I'm doing okay. My, my own health is fine, I'm now over five years on from surgery, two years on from radiotherapy, finished two years of hormone therapy, just why my hair's on this <laughs> rather fetching. <laughs> <laughs> Two years on from hormone therapy in, uh, in January, and things seem okay. The PSA, as they describe it, is still undetectable, which is, which is quite good. So uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be alive. I'm glad to be doing two things that I, I love greatly, cycling and preaching. 
and trying to serve God as best best I can. So I'm very involved in Seagate. Uh, at the grand old age of 72, they asked would I become an elder. <laughs> I thought my eldering days were past, so uh, so that's good. We're very encouraged at the church there, extremely so. We had a full Saturday morning retreat yesterday in the, in the church with the elders and the, the trustees, and it's really quite exciting, some of the things that are going on. So, encouraged, yes, very uh, encouraged. Anyway, Nahum. I've only spoken on Nahum once before. Uh, Selkirk Street, Hamilton. They always gave me nice subjects. Uh, they asked me to do four weeks in job. And then the next time I came, they said, would you do Nahum? Uh, and I spoke in the whole book. As you're probably discovering, I would say it's one of the darkest books in the whole Bible. Uh, maybe even the darkest book in the whole Bible. You've bravely allocated three sessions uh, on it. But it's compellingly relevant you couldn't have made it up at this time, the relevance of what was going on in 700 or around 700 uh, BC. Because for Assyria, substitute Russia. For Sennacherib, substitute Putin. Both agents of death. I hope you can see the, the spectator cover there. Because they've got Putin made up with skulls. You know, and obviously we've been bombarded by these, these uh, images. Uh, another of the, the spectator covers, you'll gather or read the spectator. I try and read broadly so I'm not too biased. But the spectator's a great antidote to the woke liberal agenda of the day. Plus you get quality journalists who can actually write, which is really quite, uh, really quite, quite good. Uh, but here, here was another, another cover in, in the next one. And it shows you Putin trying to bring down the, that's the standard Russian Orthodox cross. You get different crosses, that, that's the, the, the Russian cross. And he's, he's trying to bring the whole thing uh, down. And he will bring it down because the church, sadly, is basically giving him almost a mandate to conduct, you know, what he's engaged in. Now, my wife's not here, so she'll not accuse me of being political. She always says I'm far too political. Well, if you think I'm being political, wait to hear what Nahum has to say in chapter 3. Um, when I come to a book, especially a book that I'm unfamiliar with, it's quite good sometimes to get a broad introduction of it by somebody that does these things well. And no one does it better, as the song says, than Eugene Peterson in his little introductions at the beginning of each of the books of the Bible. If you have a message translation, you know, either you know, in a digital format or, or in a book, you get these little introductions and, and they're fascinating because they give you an overview of the book. So here's his introduction to, to Nahum. And he says this, The stage of history is large. Larger than life figures appear on this stage from time to time swaggering about, brandishing weapons and money, terrorising and bullying. Now, think how relevant that is today. These figures are not as they suppose themselves to be at the centre of the stage, not, in fact, anywhere near the centre, but they make a lot of noise and are able to call attention to themselves. They often manage to get a significant number of people watching and even admiring Big nations, huge armies, important people. At any given moment, a few superpower nations and their rulers dominate the daily news. Every century, a few of these names are left carved on its park benches, marking rather futile and, in retrospect, pitiable attempts at immortality. You see, what Putin's at just now is all about legacy. It's all about legacy building for him. And then this, which I thought was brilliant. The danger is that the noise of these pretenders to power will distract us from what is going on quietly at the centre of the stage in the person and action of God. And that's what Nahum chapter 3 is all about. Peterson goes on to say, God's characteristic way of working is in quietness and through prayer. I speak, says poet George Meredith, of the unremarked forces that split the heart and make the pavement toss 
forces concealed in quiet people and plants. You know, the plant can come up through the concrete. <laughs> how, how does that happen? And he's talking about the same, the same thing in prayer. If we are conditioned to respond to noise and size, we will miss God's word and action. From time to time, God assigns someone to pay attention to one or another of these persons or nations or movements just long enough to get the rest of us to quit paying so much attention to them and get back to the main action, God. And then he says, Nahum drew that assignment in the 7th century BC. Assyria had the whole world terrorized. At the time that Nahum delivered his prophecy, Assyria and its capital Nineveh appeared invincible. A world free of Assyrian domination was unimaginable. Nahum's task was to make it imaginable. It's brilliant. I wish I could write like that. I think that's brilliant. You know, a world free of Assyrian domination was unimaginable. Nahum's task was to make it imaginable. You know, to give the vision to the people of God. Sennacherib and his hordes are not going to be around forever. To free God's people from Assyrian paralysis, free them to believe in and pray to a sovereign God. Nahum's preaching, his spirit-born metaphors, his God-shaped syntax knocked Assyria off her high horse and cleared the field of Nineveh distractions so that Israel could see that despite her world reputation, Assyria didn't amount to much. This is amazing, because Assyria was a huge empire at that time, in the 7th century BC. Israel could now attend to what was really going on. Because Nahum has a single message, doom to Nineveh, Assyria, it's easy to misunderstand the prophet as simply a Nineveh hater. But Nahum writes and preaches out of the large context in which Israel's sins are denounced as vigorously as those of any of her enemies. The effect of Nahum is not to foment religious hate against the enemy, but to say, don't admire or be intimidated by this enemy. They are going to be judged by the very same standards applied to us. We need to hear that message because we're bombarded by 24-7 media. You know, with all the threats and utterances that, that Putin and Mavrov and, and all of these other uh, guys, pathetically backed by the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, particularly sad. Speaking of which, thinking of what Nahum was doing, and then here I'm political again, contrasting that with the Archbishop of Canterbury's, and I can only say his pathetic politicking, in his Easter sermon. There, there were two essential excerpts in it. And you know how the media works. The media picks up in the one that it wants to use to, to hammer whichever uh, party they're, they're again. And this is what uh, will be said. This week, this is his Easter message in Canterbury Cathedral. This week in the Eastern Orthodox world, it is Holy Week, the greatest time for repentance. And then he informed us, Muslims are in Ramadan, a time for purification and change coming to Eid. Jews celebrate the Passover and liberation. Let this be a time for Russian ceasefire, withdrawal and a commitment to talks. This is a time for resetting the ways of peace, not for what Bismarck called blood and iron. So that was his message to Putin and Russia. But then he goes on to say this, and this season is also why there are such serious ethical questions about sending asylum seekers overseas. And he uses a particular description that not everyone would, would agree with, because others might talk about economic migrants and, and the like, and highlight the fact that many asylum seekers have passed through umpteen safe countries before coming to, to the UK. But he highlights this, and it was this bit here. The details are for politics. Well, they are. And you should remember that. But he says the principle must stand the judgment of God and it cannot. So he's purporting to speak for God. Rod Little, if you know Rod Little, who writes in The Spectator, he never pulls his punches. He did a kind of spoof 
um, article in the following Spectator, where, in effect, he uh, says God has spoken to him and said basically that the Archbishop of Canterbury, if you know Rod Liddell, you know he's quite choice in how he describes him. Um, but basically the message is he had no right to speak in my behalf because he's wrong. It's what God, God was saying. We, we must hesitate to say what he said. The principle must stand the judgment of God and it cannot. That purports that he knows, you know, what God will judge in that particular way. I'm speaking about the Archbishop of, of Canterbury. You see, the contrast between his two statements couldn't be more stark. He's purporting to speak for God and his judgment read the migrant problem, but had little to say in his very much publicised Easter sermon about God's judgment on Putin. He didn't talk about that. Now, he knew the massive publicity that would be attached to that sermon, because it's always a huge publicity event. It's, it is one or well, perhaps the few occasions where the Church of England voice is actually heard nationally. And he even ensured that the juicy headlines were released in advance to the BBC, etc. Now, the contrast is this. Nahum had no such problem in calling down the judgment of God upon the Assyrians. And that is what his sermon in chapter 3 is all about. Many people, including uh, those at in Ukraine, and we've seen some of these dear old women asking, where is God in all of this? And the carnage and the, the devastation and the desolation that surrounds them. And they're saying, where is God in all this? Well, our title tonight is God is Just. God is Just. I have a, a book at home which actually picked up in Pluscarden Abbey. Uh, when we visit our friend Janet and Elgin, I always cycle out to Pluscarden Abbey. It's a Benedictine monastery. If you've never visited it, it's an amazing place. If you watched the Pilgrimage series recently, you know the Pilgrims following the steps, so they, they went to Pluscarden Abbey. Uh, it's a tremendous space, but I picked this, this book up uh, there, and it's written, it was edited by G.I. Packer, and a man called uh, Derek Williams, the Bible Application Handbook. And, and I thought this was lovely. Standing somewhere behind all oppressors is a caring God who hates what he sees them do. Our part is to trust that he will move against them in his own time and so demonstrate his righteousness. It may be in this life or the next, but it will occur. This is one of the biblical antidotes to stress and anxiety. Justice is assured. Rescue is likely. Support is offered in the meantime. Only the timing of the end result is uncertain, not the result itself. And I think as God's people, we have to hold that. And that's a message we have to communicate to people who are saying, where is God in all of this? Putin's time will come, as Hitler's did, and as Stalin's did, and as Sennacherib's did. Sennacherib, this tyrant of the, the 7th century BC, ended his days murdered by his two sons. There was maybe a palace revolt, as they, they, they describe it. And who knows what's going to happen in the Kremlin over these coming weeks or, or months. In 722 BC, the Assyrians had brought to an end the northern kingdom of Israel. And Sennacherib, who was perhaps the most powerful of all of their, their kings, reigned from 704 to 681, and he made Nineveh the capital of his kingdom. But in 612 BC, Nineveh was destroyed, never to be restored, marking the end of Assyria. The Syrian Empire disappeared in 612 BC from being the most important empire. It's gone. It's gone. Greek Empire, you know, it's still there. Vestiges of it, even Babylonian, uh, Roman. All of these, Assyria is gone. And perhaps the most brutal and most powerful of, of all of them. So just a wee kind of revision of Nahum's uh, little book 
Uh, Warren Wearsby, I find always uh, very helpful. I don't know where you've actually used his uh, his headings, but um, he, he talks about this in, in chapter one. God is jealous; none of it will fall. And then God is judge; how none of it will fall. And then in chapter three, God is just; why none of it will fall? Why is it going to fall? Uh, David Posson, who's got a, a, a single volume. <laughs> Uh, book called Unlocking the Bible. It's a great big thick tome, about a thousand page, but eminently readable. It give, gives you an overview of all the, the, the books. And he suggests an almost identical approach. Uh, so you've got chapter one, proclamation, who, intervention. Chapter two, description, how, invasion. And then chapter three, explanation, why. Now here's a coincidence, or is it a coincidence? We're, we're going through a big chunk of Isaiah's prophecy. Now, you may know Isaiah was a contemporary of, of Nahum and, and Micah. But we're going through Isaiah's uh, prophecy. And Richard w- was preaching on Isaiah chapter 33 uh, this morning. And I just noted down, I said, I'm going to mention this tonight because this is exactly you know, what, what we're looking at in, in Nahum. And here is what Isaiah 33 verse 1 says. What sorrow awaits you, Assyrians, who have destroyed others but have never been destroyed yourselves? You betray others but you have never been betrayed. When you are done destroying, you will be destroyed. This is what Isaiah says. When you are done betraying, you will be betrayed. And here's this rampant bully, psychopathic bully, who at the end of the day is killed by his two sons. You will be destroyed. Verse 10 says, But the Lord says, Now I will stand up. Now I will show my power and might. So I'm going to read chapter 3. And it should really carry a health warning, uh, this, but uh, it's the word of God. So Nahum launches out in chapter 3, Woe to the city of blood! Full of plunder, never without victims, the crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses and jolting chariots. As as you listen to this, think about tanks and artillery and cruise missiles. Charging cavalry, flashing swords and glittering spears, many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without number, people stumbling over the corpses. Now, we're getting pictures of this on an almost daily basis on our television screens. But Nahum is drawing this picture for, for his listeners. All because of the wanton lust of a prostitute. That's a metaphor for, for the nation of uh, Assyria. Alluring, the mistress of sorceries who enslaved nations by her prostitution and peoples by her witchcraft. I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will pelt you with filth. I will treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. So, is Nahum politically correct? He's communicating the message of of God. Uh, I wish that some of our religious and political leaders would maybe take a lesson from, from the word of God. And then verse 7, all who see you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is in ruins. Who will mourn for her? Where can I find anyone to comfort you? Are you better than Thebes, situated on the Nile, with water around her? The river was her defence, the waters her wall. Cush and Egypt were her boundless strength. Put and Libya were among her allies. Yet she was taken captive, the Egyptian nation, and went into exile Her infants were dashed to pieces at every street corner. Lots were cast for her nobles, and all her great men were put in chains. You too will become drunk. You will go into hiding and seek refuge from the enemy, he says to the Assyrians. All your fortresses are like fig trees with their first ripe fruit. When they are shaken, the figs fall into the mouth of the eater. You think you're so strong with the ramparts and a good shake and it all falls to pieces. Look at your troops. 
They are all weaklings. The gates of your land are wide open to your enemies. Fire has consumed the bars of your gates. Draw water for the siege. Strengthen your defences. Work the clay. Tread the mortar. Repair the brickwork. There the fire will consume you. The sword will cut you down. They will devour you like a swarm of locusts. Multiply like grasshoppers. Multiply like locusts. You have increased the number of your merchants till they are more numerous than the stars in the sky. But the locusts, they strip the land and then fly away. Your guards are like locusts. Your officials like a swarm of locusts. They settle, that settle in the walls on a cold day. But when the sun appears, they fly away and no one knows where. King of Assyria, he points the finger at the leader. Your shepherds slumber. Your nobles lie down to rest. Your people are scattered on the mountains with no one to gather them. Nothing can heal you. Your wound is fatal. All who hear the news about you clap their hands at your fall. For who has not felt your endless cruelty? Now, I don't know if you've been using Warren Beesby's heading or, or not, but he, he calls this God is just. And when you look at commentators, to give you an insight into this, they're, they're all more or less coming at it the, the same way. I dipped into uh, John MacArthur Jr. a wee bit as, as well. Uh, he doesn't hold back uh, either. So, so Nahum is giving three reasons why uh, Syria, uh, Assyria is going to, to fall, why Nineveh will fall. And the reasons are, are, are this. The ruthless bloodshed. Verses 1 to 3, we read that, it's very graphic. Their idolatry, that's the image of the, the, the prostitute. And then their pride and self-confidence from verses 8 to, to 19. Nothing like this can happen to us. And they didn't learn the lesson from, from history. Now, as I continue through this, I continue to encourage you to compare Assyria with present-day Russia. I think that's very, very important. When we look and we wring our hands and we wonder what, where will all this lead where Putin's threatening nuclear war and Third World War. I don't know if any of us were old enough to be around at the time of, of the, last, the last war. I was certainly born three years after its completion, but we never ever thought we'd see something like this in our day and generation in, in Europe, of all places, but it's happening. And it could escalate, we... We don't know. So it's, it's very, very good that we keep coming back to, to the message here. So, uh, their ruthless bloodshed. Uh, I just put this wee bit clip up on, on yesterday. The Assyrians were, were the, the empire that, that most used chariots. They were the ones, I think, that discovered the iron and stuff like that. So, so they were at the very vanguard of this lethal weapon. Chariots were a game changer at the time of the Syrians. And they, 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 they dominated the, the, the people they, they, they sought to subdue. And I think I may have put there, yeah, tanks. Think of the tanks of their time. You know, mere individuals couldn't stand, stand against it. The ruthless bloodshed. Woe to the city of blood. And then you... You've got this powerful language. You hear the crack of the whips, the clatter of the wheels, galloping horses, jolting chariots. You're there. You're right in what's going on here. Charging cavalry, flashing swords, glittering spears. Wonderful use of language. He didn't have images such as we have to convey this, so he, he was painting all of these, these word pictures. John MacArthur uh, Jr. In, in verse 1 describes the, the city as a bloody city. And it's an accusation that is well documented in history. Assyria proved to be an unusually cruel, bloodthirsty nation. About four years, four or five years ago, I think it was, the last time we were in London, uh, we visited the British Museum. And a place I wanted to see was the Assyrian exhibition. Have any of you ever been to the British Museum and, and seen the Assyrian Hall. No. Next time you're in London, go to the British Museum and visit that. It's perhaps one of the most spectacular exhibitions of artefacts from 7th uh, century BC 
and, and they're there. These murals on the wall. And basically these, these murals are boasting about the terrible atrocities they committed. They've got them there graphically on the wall. People having their skins flayed. People having their eyes put out. The Assyrians wanted this marked. They wanted people to, to remember them for this. Fascinating but, but brutal. So they were, they were a brutal regime. And that is why God will judge them. But not only were they, were they brutal, but their cruelty. Now you get wars and you get wars. And presumably the purpose of a war is to win the war. But what sadly we're seeing in, for example, Ukraine just now, are gratuitous atrocities where women are being raped and, and things like that. Horrific things that are unnecessary in the winning of the war. They're just a display of, of cruelty. And the cruelty of the Assyrians was compounded by their lies. Uh, it tells us that in, in verse 1. Woe to the, the city of blood, full of lies. Full of lies. Now, apparently, I'm assured by the historians, the Assyrians were very clever diplomats who lied to other nations and then broke their promises and destroyed the nations. You know, you can even read all about it in the, the relationship with, with Judah. Uh, you know, Judah were trying to pay them off. <laughs> so they sent all the, all the gold and stuff for the temple and, and the like, and Sennacherib said, thanks very much, and then still came to attack them. They made promises and then broke them. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? Putin and Russia. How many times have we heard about humanitarian corridors that are to be set up and then come to nothing in Mario Paul in particular. Or these stories where women and children were allowed to leave their houses and as they were crossing the street they were gunned down in cold blood. Or firing a cruise missile at Kiev while the General Secretary of the UN is actually there on a peace mission. The, the Russian propaganda is alarmingly deluding the Russian population, many of whom are good people, but they're only getting one side of the story. And a, probably a repeat of what Adolf Hitler did with uh, the German nation and got them to collude in his mad scheme. And only heroic people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, for example, you know, stood up against them and Bonhoeffer paid for that with, with his, his life. So the people are in denial about the atrocities that are being perpetrated in their name because it's part and parcel of it. And it's been part and parcel of things in, in our day and age for the last number of years. When we think of the Salisbury poisonings, for example, and all the evidence of that, but no, no, that doesn't stack up you know, say the, the Russian press. The Assyrians appeared to slaughter people without regard for age or, or sex. And as the passage says, they stacked up the corpses like lumber as a warning to anybody who would oppose them. The French have a saying, pour en courage les autres, that the others might be in courage. Their instrument was, of course, the, the guillotine. But the shedding of innocent blood, and this is through and through the whole of the word of God, the shedding of innocent blood is a serious sin that God notes and God remembers and God judges. God notes it, he remembers it, and he judges. There's no need for crime investigators going in on behalf of the UN or anybody else to get the evidence. God has the evidence. And God is just, and as a Syrian was judged, so what's going on in Ukraine just now will be judged. And the important thing for us to remember, and the people of Nahum's day, was that these depraved dictators who authorised these heartless killings of innocent people will someday answer to God for their crimes against him and humanity. And that's where I think it's really appalling that Putin has tried to involve the church 
and by implication God in his reckless campaign. That is blasphemous in the extreme. So God is going to judge them because of their ruthless cruelty. But then he's going to judge them, Nahum tells us, because of their idolatry. Verse 4, all because of the wanton lust of a prostitute alluring the mysteries of sorceries who enslaved nations by her prostitution and peoples by her her witchcraft. And you'll probably know this, but but very often in in the Bible, idolatry is associated with with prostitution, you know, because it's very much the the concept that God has said, I I am the Lord your God, you know, you shall only worship me. And repeatedly, when, when his people abandoned him for other gods, they were accused of prostitution because they were leaving the God to whom they were betrothed for a relationship with, with other gods. So idolatry is very often associated with, with prostitution. John MacArthur again puts it this way in verse 4. The second charge against Nineveh was spiritual and moral harlotry. That's how he puts it, spiritual and moral harlotry. And he says, The nation was likened to a beautiful prostitute who seduced the nations with her illicit enticements. <laughs> We just look, we look askance at what's going on in Westminster just now. You know, it's, it almost beggars, beggars belief. You know, the people are, are so far gone and have lost so much self-respect that they're, that they're doing, or are accused of doing some of the things that, uh, that are featured in, in the news. Now, here's a thing I didn't know until I was preparing this, but the chief deity of Nineveh, Remember, Nineveh is the capital city of Assyria that Jonah was sent to prophesy against 100 years before this. Uh, but the, the chief deity of Nineveh was a goddess called Ishtar. And Ishtar was, quote, the goddess of sexual passion, fertility, and war. So, the commentator said, we can understand why Nahum used this metaphor. And because of their spiritual blindness, the Assyrians were ensnared by the worship of this goddess. They were ensnared by what she, she offered, and they became under uh, her control, uh, and, and it was about lust and greed and violence. And, and here's, here's a very telling point. People become like the god they worship. People become like the god they worship. For what we believe determines how we behave. Now, a lot of politicians don't really buy into this, but, but it's true. What we believe will determine how we behave. And that is what was going on here. So they lied. And they, they lied to their own people. But they also lied to other nations. They spread this evil influence to, to other, other nations. This whole concept of, of enticing and compromising and enslaving uh, people. So, so many people are, are enslaved just now by, by one kind of god or goddess or, or another. The, the guy who's recently, presumably by this time, has resigned, I'm, I'm not sure, Parish, I think his name was, has, has become enslaved by pornography. He's become enslaved by that, and, and it's all around. And it's a case of, of, of making a very conscious stance, <laughs> not to try and excuse ourselves by saying we're looking for a website in tractors, which is apparently what he, they, he tried, tried to do. It's, as Job said, I have made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a woman. It's all about choices. But you see, they had spread their, their, their evil influence to, to other uh, nations. And what God says is he would expose Assyria's nakedness before all the nations. And you've got a very, very graphic thing, which I won't, I won't describe again. You can read it for, for yourself. But, but here, here you are that think, you know, you're the bee's knees, so to speak. You're, you're nothing, says God, and I will expose your nakedness before the other nations. And this magnificent, wealthy city would become a heap of ruins. Which brings us on to the other reason that God would judge their pride and self 
confidence. And this in actual fact, would you believe that that building there is part of what was the Assyrian Empire? That is part of what was Nineveh. And at the time of ISIS, you know, where they were demolishing a whole lot of buildings and sacred things, and they were quite indiscriminate. You know, the Buddha was shot to bits by the, their guns, but, but they tried to blow up uh, part, part of this in Mosul. That's where the, the kind of headquarters uh, were. But this, in actual fact, was part of that Assyrian Empire of almost 3,000 years ago. Quite, quite astonishing. They, they were proud, they were self-confident, and Nahum says to them in verse 8, Are you better than Thebes, situated on the Nile? Nineveh was situated on the banks of the, tri the Tigris. You know, you've got the Tigris and Euphrates. It was situated on, on the bank because people built cities there for defensive reasons. Because if you've got a big river flowing on one side of you, that kind of looks after itself, you know, defensively. Um, are you better than Thebes? It was situated on the Nile. Maybe some of you have visited it. I understand it's still there. With water around her. The river was her defence, the water's her wall, because they didn't have big battleships in these days. Having said that, <laughs> the big battleship that the Ukrainians managed to sink <laughs> uh, in you know, the, the, the Black Sea or whatever, that, that, that was really, really something. But you see, they didn't learn the lesson of history. The Syrians didn't learn the lesson. They were able to conquer the Egyptian Empire, they, they were able to, to, to take over Thebes, you know, by tactics, and the same tactics would be employed against them. And then the same tactics would be employed, employed again, uh, the Babylonian Empire, you know, read about Belshazzar Feast and, and, and all of that. People, poor tyrants, don't learn the lesson of history. Uh, I, I watched a three-part series on, on Hitler and, and Stalin, you know, it was, on, it was on the BBC just a couple of months ago. And the mistakes that both of these psychopaths made was staggering. Because they started believing their own infallibility and their own invulnerability. And they, they didn't listen to the advice they, they were getting. They didn't learn the lessons of, of history. If Hitler even had paid any kind of attention to Napoleon's assault on Russia in 1815, famous for its... Uh, 1812, famous for its 1812 overture. It's about the, the, the French trying to attack Russia at that time, and they did it at the wrong time. They went just at the beginning of winter, and their troops were frozen to death. Derek Bingham's got a lovely little book, When the Storks Flew South. And he said, if the French generals had lifted their eyes to see the flight of the storks above them, they would notice the storks were flying south. Why? Because winter was coming. And basically, the Russians won that in 1812 because of the Russian winter. Did Hitler learn? No. <laughs> so he, he pushes on. Same with the Assyrians. They don't learn. And the picture basically shows that the, the militants of Islamic State there have destroyed a large portion. I'm just reading from the website now. Uh, of the ancient Nineveh wall in Mosul, which dates back some 2,700 years. And, of course, it's a secular website. It's making a great point about the, the terrible loss of these archaeological, historical, religious uh, sites. But the king of Assyria didn't learn the lesson. And Putin hasn't learned the lesson. We trust he will learn the lesson. We, we've got, uh, we're have got we still continuing our prayer meetings, uh, well, one of them anyway, on a Tuesday night in Zoom. And there's one woman, bless her, who, and she always prays that Vladimir Putin will get converted. Now, that would be wonderful. Uh, I'm a bit more pragmatic. I pray that God will intervene in the way that God, <laughs> God see, sees most fit in, in the situation. Because it looks like Putin is not learning the lesson of, of history. And then in, in the closing section, and uh, I'll, I'll wrap it up quite quick, uh, quickly, Nahum uh, uses a number of, of images, powerful images, graphic images, to, to capture the imagination of, 
of, of the people. He talks about the defeat of the Egyptian city of, 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 of Thebes. And he, he then is basically proclaiming that the judgment is total. Judgment will be total. And he says, Nineveh will drink the cup of God's wrath and become drunk. And you know what comes after drunk and incapable. <laughs> they will drink the cup of God's wrath. And then graphically he says, the conquest is going to be so easy that it will be like ripe figs dropping into a person's mouth. You don't even have to work to get the figs. So much for your, for, for your, for your forces. You know, they're going to fold like a pack of, of cards. He says these ferocious Assyrian soldiers would be drained of their strength and be like women, weak, afraid, and unable to meet the enemy. And then he, he talks this very graphic image, verses 15 to 17, of the, of the locusts, the insects, the invading soldiers would sweep through the land and the city like a plague of grasshoppers and locusts and wipe everything out. And he said that's what's going to happen to Assyria going to happen to Assyria. And sure enough, that is what, what happened. And then he says, not only that, but you'll be, your flock will be scattered. The people will be scattered. Why? Because the shepherds are asleep. <laughs> the shepherds are asleep. They, they've miscalculated. How many miscalculations have we seen in this current Ukrainian situation? You know, this great big flagship battleship was going to terrorize everybody. And it's now lying at the, the foot of, of the sea. Miscalculation can't possibly happen to us. Nahum says this is what's going to, to happen to you. The, the flock will be scattered because the shepherds, the leaders, are asleep. Or he says very graphically, you're like a wounded body with no way to be healed. Verse 19, a wounded body with no way to be healed. And then it says when they heard, they would rejoice that the Assyrian Empire was no more. Here is what Warren Wearsby said. I just uh, typed this in or copied it in uh, earlier this afternoon, after my 10-mile bike ride. Uh, he says, like the book of Jonah, the book of Nahum ends with a question, for who has not felt your endless cruelty? What a terrible epitaph that is, isn't it? Who has not felt your endless cruelty? Verse 19. Nahum emphasizes the same truth that was declared by the prophet Amos. God punishes cruel nations that follow inhumane policies and brutal practices. Whether it's practicing genocide, exploiting the poor, supporting slavery, or failing to provide people with the necessities of life, the sins of national leaders are known by God. And he eventually judges. And then Wiersbe says this, and it's brilliant. If you question that fact, go and search for Nineveh. Because <laughs> it's not there. You'll get wee bits and pieces of it, such as Isis tried to uh, destroy. And Sennacherib would be killed by his sons. Because, to go back to that quotation from earlier, Standing somewhere behind all oppressors is a caring God who hates what he sees them do. If we're appalled by what's going on in Ukraine, how is God feeling about that? We can say from the word of God, he's much more appalled than we are. He hates it. Our part is to trust that he will move against them in his own time and so demonstrate his righteousness. It may be in this life, or the next, but it will occur. This is one of the biblical antidotes to stress and anxiety. Justice is assured. Rescue is likely. Support is offered in the meantime. Only the timing of the end result is uncertain, not the result itself. I was looking for a piece of clip art for the, the biter being bitten, but I couldn't really get anything. So I decided, could I get something on the fact that Putin will fall? And I did. So here it is. <laughs> Putin, as you know, has always set himself up as a macho man. You know, he used every opportunity to take his shirt off. Uh, there's no way I would even contemplate taking my shirt off. Not for the last 20 years or so anyway. 
Uh, but and he, he does all of these physical pursuits, and you know he'll have teams set up against him so his team can win. That's the way these guys conduct it. Uh, but I got this one in the in the website, and it will happen. And what we have to do at the meantime, in in our current situation where we we see innocent people being wiped out, is to pray that God will intervene. It's not for us to tell God how He will do that. But God, in his own time, will intervene. And the people who are responsible for what we are seeing daily on our television screens will one day stand before God. Will one day stand before God. So, quite a guy was our Nahum, wasn't he? Brave, brave man, but very, very gifted man in his use of language and rhetoric. And we could do with people like that, that today. Let's ask God's <laughs> blessing. Father, we, we thank you for your word. And repeatedly, Lord, the, the truth of your word has been revealed by subsequent discoveries and, and archaeology. I mean, you'd only take a visit to the British Museum in London to see the terrible atrocities that the Assyrians themselves documented, carved into stone of the genocide that they, they practice. But Lord, over and above all of that, you knew what happened. And it's recorded in, in your book because as we've been reflecting this evening, Lord, God is just and shall not the judge of all the earth do right. And so, Lord, we do pray that you will intervene in your way in the Ukrainian-Russian situation. We don't know how that will be, Lord, but we trust it to you. And for ourselves, Lord, may we take the lesson that let him that thinketh he standeth Take heed lest he fall. Lord, we've, we've seen so many lessons of, of people who have fallen badly. And equally we can fall if we don't keep short accounts with you. And so the lesson for us to learn and the lesson for your people, the, the nation of Judah, to learn was to, was to trust in you and to be a people who were characterized by repentance. So Lord, help us just on an ongoing daily basis to repent of the things that we've got wrong and just seek your Holy Spirit's help and the guidance of your Holy Word just to direct us in paths of truth. I want to just pray, Lord, your blessing on this church, this fellowship, who have been so faithful over uh, many years, but particularly this last year, Lord, when, when my wife Jean was so unwell, they prayed faithfully. And I want just to thank you, Lord, for that, and I want to thank them for that too. And so, Lord, just bless us now. Uh, and so we've spent this time together for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>